Bishop Noel Jones. God is going to use him greatly in the name of the Lord Jesus. I want you to stand on your feet. I want you to take your right hand and point at him and say, Bishop, let God use you. Whatever he tells you to say, say it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's give him a PAW, where the Christ State Council of Noel. Take somebody's hand, if you will, and leave nobody untouched. Surely, as I meditated a little bit on, on what to pray about before we went into the message, my mind went to David. And the Talmud indicates that there was a little rift between David's mother and, and Jesse. Jesse was beginning to feel less than he should because of Ruth the Moabitess. Yes. When David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The Moabites were not allowed into the temple to the 13th generation. But Boaz, of course, married Ruth. And Boaz begot Obed, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. But the Moabites shouldn't be in the temple to the 13th generation. But Boaz begot Obed, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. But they were not alive to the 13th generation. But Obed, but Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse. Jesse begot David. I was glad. I didn't have to wait 13 generations. And because of that, the Talmud says that Jesse did not go into David's mother and made a little plan to go into one of the maids because he wanted to have some more children. The maid got with the mother and a little bit like Jacob and Rachel and that kind of situation, he ends up with the mother. But the boys and the family thought that she was playing around our terms. So that's why David was always on the outside. They sent him to handle the sheep so that he would die. But God helped him to take care of the bear and the lion. I want to pray for somebody who has always been on the outside. And God is going to take you from obscurity to notoriety because his anointing is upon you. And it doesn't matter who keeps you on the outside. Samuel's not going to leave until he anoints the right hand. Squeeze those hands, Father, in the name of Jesus. We honor you, we lift up, we sublimate, we magnify, we macrograph your holy name. And we thank you because you're the one who anoints, you're the one who appoints, and we just want to thank you for that right now. For that person among us who is anointed and appointed. But we just don't know it yet. We pray God that you bring them up out of obscurity. And put them in the place where you ordain them to be. And we'll give you the glory and the praise. Because you're the one who chooses. You're the one who elevates. And you're the one who puts down. And we just want to thank you for whatever you do. So bless the hands we hold right now. Bless every ministry in this house. Give every minister the insight and the depth in these contemporary times to touch lives everywhere. And I claim it in the name of Jesus. Squeeze those hands. I squeeze joy in these hands. 
I squeeze power in these hands. I squeeze a fresh anointing in these hands. Financial prosperity in these hands. I squeeze wisdom in these hands. Sagacity in these hands. And I claim the victory right now. Healing where healing is needed. Power where power is needed. Do it, Lord. And we'll give you the glory. We'll give you the praise. And we claim it done in Jesus' name. And if you believe God, lose hands. Give God the glory. And we'll bless the Lord. And all is free. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And certainly to our illustrious presiding bishop, to the indubitable bishop, Theodore Brooks, amen. To our first and First Vice Presider to the Honorable Bishop Mark Talbert and to Second Vice Presider, certainly and especially to Bishop Michael Hanna. Amen. To our host bishop, certainly tonight, Bishop Lance Foster, to our former <laughs> bishop. Yes, uh, to our former presiding bishop, Bishop Harold Smith. Amen. And to, uh, I don't know if it's Suffolk and Bishop District of the Wood, where are you floating in these days? <laughs> and to Master Ceremonies, amen, of course, to Pastor Foster, amen, and, and to his lovely wife, and, and just to everybody that's gathered here, to everyone who expostulates the Word of God on any level, amen, on any level. If you're riding in the bus and you speak to somebody and the Holy Spirit shows up, you spoke the word of God. Amen. You didn't have to say, verily, verily, I say unto you. You can speak in your own idiomatic language, your own colloquialism, and if somebody is touched by it, that it was the word of God. You don't need a title. God said, I'd make your name great. That's what he said to Abraham. I'd make your name great. And we try to do with titles many times what we can't do with our names. I'll make your name great. So we honor this great council and uh, yes, the greater tri-state council. We honor the council and we're glad to be here tonight. And uh, it's just marvelous to be in the house of the Lord one more time. I would that you turn with me tonight to the book of Philippians and it's Philippians chapter 2 Philippians chapter 2 the book of Philippians is interesting because it is actually a book of rejoicing what makes it so particularly interesting is that the the writer is under house arrest he is now under the hand of Nero. And when you understand the the trauma that comes oftentimes when you're at the end of a particular ministry, when you come to the end of a ministry, end of a life, and you're battling to reconcile what God's will is for your life and where you're going. I'm sure all of us have been at the place at some times in our lives where we had to reconcile what God was doing in our lives with what we believed that we wanted him to do. And to come to that place where we had peace, where we found peace with the action of God in our lives and what we wanted or wished he would do. I had to deal with that twice when my mother died. I had to come to the place where I reconciled to God's will for what he was going to do as opposed to what I wanted him to do. Uh, I, I am going to chapter two. Let me read chapter two and then I'll argue uh, a 
little bit of that with Paul in chapter 1. I uh, didn't intend to go that way. I'm having an epiphany. Uh, in chapter 2, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, okay. if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Yeah. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. It's a hard thing to do. That's right. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he yeah. humbled himself yeah. and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And somebody ought to already be excited. Well, I might as well give you a survey. Look at the name and say uh, he made a name for himself. Look at somebody else and say, if you want to make a name for yourself, humble yourself. The, the battle to reconcile what God intends to do and what we would like him to do is an age-old battle that goes all the way back even to Paul. Oftentimes we, we, we take biblical characters and we extricate them from a contemporary environment. We take them out of our own lives and our own issues and we give them some sort of special type of revenge. And many times we act as if they didn't have the same kind of feelings that we have. And oftentimes that leads us not to deal with the scriptures as poignant as we should because we make it more mystical and more ontological. We put it off to another time. But I am noticing that Paul is literally struggling here to reconcile what God is doing in his life to what he would like to see happen in his life. And I noticed that in the first chapter. I'm just going to, if you allow me an addendum, I will go through this with you. And in chapter 1, you will notice that he is saying in about verse, uh, about verse 20, he is saying, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always. Yeah. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or death. Uh -huh. The question that you would ask based on the this presentation is why Paul all of a sudden you are seeking a kind of strength to be bold when you have always been bold and why are you speaking now about in nothing being ashamed when we have a record of you being quite reckless in your presentation of Jesus Christ and now, all of a 
a sudden it seems as if you're struggling with the whole idea of being bold. He says, I want to be as always, as always. I want to magnify the Lord in my body. And then he suggests the two antitheticals, whether in life or in death. He, he then goes on to say, for me to live is Christ, and of course to die is gain. And to understand that, and very quickly, if I'm living Christ, I have to live Christ with a struggle. If I live Christ in this life, I have to overcome some things in order to live Christ. Nobody in here lives Christ without having antithetical thoughts, without having to overcome fleshly appetites and to hold oneself under control. To live Christ is a challenge. I know you all are way more sanctified than I am, but to live Christ is even to you a challenge. There were times when there were certain people we would like to just straighten out and some people we would like to fix and sometimes some words that we used to say would come back to us and we have to choke them off. And to live Christ is a struggle at times but to die is gain because in death I no longer have a struggle. Mm -hmm. He continues, but if I live in the flesh, that is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose, I would not. Right. Now Paul, right. we're taking it a little far here, and here's why. He is under Nero's hand. He right. is in house arrest. Right. Right. So even though right. he's talking about choosing, his life isn't really in his hand at this time. His life is simply in the hand of God, but he's under Nero's guard, which means then that he cannot just walk into Nero and say, let me go, uh -huh, because Nero now has him under heavy manners. He says, for I'm caught betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. If I go, I'm happy. But if I stay, I'm staying for your sake. Because I need to impart some more things to you to make you stronger and to make you better. Now here is where we go wrong. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and the joy of your fruit. If I'm to understand that properly, he's saying, I'm going to be here for you. The truth is that he never got back, that he was executed, he was killed before he got back. He never went back to the Philippian church in spite of verse 25. What this tells me then, if the great uh, revelatory receiver, Paul, can have difficulties trying to reconcile God's will for his life to the things that he wanted to do, then I can surely say to you and to me that if he had problems uh, reconciling his situation with God, then certainly I must not be self-condemnatory when I'm trying to reconcile my situation with God. Uh, I'm almost there. It's a critical piece because oftentimes, and then let me, since I'm over here, let me deal a little bit with what we really have. Uh, Paul, and it's astounding because I ask oftentimes, what did, how much time do I have, Bishop? I, I ask him, I ask God all the time, what kind of relationship did Paul have with him? To the point where he had such revelatory experiences that completely wipe us out. Indeed, and in fact, none of us really getting any revelation. The revelation is already here. What I'm doing tonight 
has nothing to do with revelation. It has everything to do with illumination. Because the revelatory expression of God is already in front of me. Uh, it's an interesting dynamic. It's a very interesting dynamic how we don't get along. It's an interesting dynamic. Uh, particularly when Paul is receiving revelation. Uh, I argue with Bishop McClendon all the time when he says we need a fresh word. And I said, well, Bishop, what is a fresh word? Could you help me with this fresh word? If it's an interpretation of the revelation that has already been given, and if it's the application in a contemporary environment that is the fresh word, I go along with you. But if I'm going to get up in the pulpit and get something that is not already revealed, then of course we're going to have a problem. Uh, we are in the business of illuminating what has already been revealed. And yet we, in our illumination, can illuminate so clearly that we fall out with each other because I got it right and you don't have it so right. So I am superior to you in my presentation because I have an illumination that you have not yet ascribed to. Now, the person who's getting the revelation, who is Paul, he says to us, we look through a glass darkly. Now, he's getting the revelation, and he's not seeing it so clearly, and we are illuminating, and we see more clearly in our illumination than he did in his revelation, so we don't get along with each other because we got it so right, whereas he says we look through a glass darkly. With all the revelation he had, he didn't boast about seeing it as clearly as we see it. We're illuminating what was revealed to him, yet we see it clearer than he sees it, so we can fall out with each other. Foolishness. It is critical now because he is writing in reconciling himself to God. He is making a presentation of a book that is called uh, the all-sufficiency of Christ. Christ is all-sufficient. Now, when you deal with the sufficiency of Christ, you have to be God-forsaken to understand that my grace is sufficient. In other words, if the Lord would respond to everything we need, and if he would immediately come to us and not allow us any moments of tension and any moments of friction, if he will not allow us any situations where he just won't move until he gets ready, then we would never understand my grace is sufficient. The book of Philippians can be called the all-sufficiency of Christ because the writer is making a presentation of joy while he is in a negative situation. He is caught in a situation where he's in prison, he's under house arrest, and he's writing to people who are free, and he's declaring to them that they should rejoice in Christ Jesus in spite of the situation, because my situation does not connect me to my God. My connection to God is not material. My connection to God is not physical. My connection to God is not intellectual. My connection to God is only spiritual. It's a critical thing because when we study what has happened over the years, we have studied uh, the nominal church and then we studied traditional Pentecostal. We move from the traditional Pentecostals to the neo-Pentecostals. We went from neo-Pentecostals to 
charismaticism, and from charismaticism we went to word of faith. Every time we progressed, we progressed and we took faith from heavenly things and we brought it to earthly things. Oh yes, faith now became measured by what we wear, what we drive, where we live, and we pushed the saints into a place where they thought that their relationship with God was material. Oh yes, uh, yeah, I can judge by what you wear. We expostulated faith at the expense of love. Because what we said is, if you had my faith, you could have what I have. So consequently, why should I be penalized to help you when if you had some faith? Now, 2008, things shifted because we couldn't preach Americanism for gospel any longer when things crashed. People lost their jobs and people lost their houses and pastors and preachers lost their churches. Mm -hmm. There was a time the bank wouldn't repossess a church, but after 2008, they took the churches back. Uh, the saints that I pastor, they said, don't send any more prophets over here. We don't want to see another prophet because I lost my house, I lost my car, and if they had any prophetic eye at all, they should have told me this was going to happen. Uh, you see, if materialism is your strength in God, and you lose your stuff, then your relationship is gone. Uh, oh yes, what Paul is saying to us is it doesn't matter what circumstance you're in, your relationship with God is not contingent on your situation or your circumstance. Uh, what he did then was he proved that some people's valleys are higher than other people's peaks. Uh, should I say that again? That some people who are in the valley in terms of their circumstance, they are still higher than other people's peaks. Have you ever been to the hospital and somebody was terminally ill with cancer and you ask God to give you all the wisdom in the world to go in and encourage the individual who was sick? You went into the room all geared up and all anointed and ready to yeah. say the right thing only for the person who is sitting there terminally to encourage you and strengthen you and you walk out of there with more power than you went in and you're dealing with somebody who's looking at the end of their life because some people in their lowest low is still higher than other people at their highest high. Because whenever you have the relationship with God that supersedes anything that is around you, even when you're low, you're still higher than folk who are depending on things to make a relationship with God. It's an easy comparison if you look at the Rockies here uh, and you look at the Himalayas. The valley in the Himalayas is way higher than the highest peak in the Rocky Mountain Range. Just take one of those valleys in Tibet and you're still way above. Oh, I want to live so. I, I want to live so. That no matter what you take from me, I can still give God the glory and still give him praise for the relationship. He brings him now to an exhortation of unity. And he now reassures them that they have to be victorious together. The reason is they need joint participation uh, among themselves in the things that are common to each one of them. And this is what you call fellowship. Fellowship is when we have 
joint participation in the things that are common to each one of us. If we don't have a commonality among us, then we can't have any fellowship because fellowship is significantly important for the individuals who come together in the house of God. Uh, I don't want to get in trouble tonight, but I'm having a lot of problems with the, uh, I better just say uh, evangelicals. I almost said something else. Because the singular in the world, in the universe, is the Holy Spirit. With any class, creed, race, the Holy Spirit is the single greatest unifier in the universe. And I'm wondering what something is dreadfully wrong. It's a problem in a church environment. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll preach that another time. But I'm calling people out now because we're living in a time when everybody's divided because there is no real fellowship when it comes to joint participation in the things that are common to each one of us, then we forget the color of our skin. Uh, there should never be such a thing as a white church or a black church. A church is just a church. Because in Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither Greek or Jew, but all are one in Christ Jesus. You see, God is so much one that there is no division in him at all. And when you come into God, he eliminates all of the differences that people have because the participation now becomes joint because we're focusing totally and completely on him. The question now is if each saint then is indwelt by the spirit why is there not that unity among the saints which Paul speaks? And the answer is, of course, joint participation in an interest and a mutual and active participation in the things of God is produced by the Spirit. Not by virtue of His indwelling, but by virtue of His control. Everybody who has the Holy Spirit isn't controlled by the Spirit. And we have to get to that place where the Spirit controls us above our personal aggrandizement, our narcissistic proclivities, and our egomaniacal attitudes. The Holy Spirit has to bring us to the place where we understand that we are no better than anybody else and title and money and position don't make you better than the average child of God that walks into the house. Oh, I feel something pushing me. I, I behave. You see, the control of the spirit, the Philippians have those among them who were not spirit controlled. So now Paul is saying to them, in my absence, now that I'm not with you, you've got to work together. You've got to come together. Now you and I understand the dynamics of that because oftentimes we have been in families where we had big mama. We had, you know, the strong character in the family. And the kids can't get along, but uh, Thanksgiving, when they sit around that table, they're going to get along. And, mm -hmm, you know the story. They're going to get along because Big Mama's not going to have any foolishness around her dining table. Now, you might not talk to each other after you leave the dinner table, but you're going to talk to each other right now. There is a personality that's strong enough to keep people together who would be together if that person wasn't there. I can tell you when a church is growing. I can tell you when you have a church that's thriving. It's when you have a lot of people 
people in your office and in position in your churches who can't get along with each other, but they all get along with you. That tells me there is a wideness in the leader's capacity to bring people together who would normally be together, but because of the strength of the leader, they stay together. What Paul is saying now is that I'm absent. And in my absence, I need you to work out your own salvation. I can't work it for you because I'm not there. So I need you now to function with each other, even though your leader is not present. Now he is pointing out then that we have to have unity. But you cannot have unity except you have humility. Because if everybody is seeking their own, then you can never have unity without humility. I didn't hear the choir tonight, but I'm sure you had a melodious and euphonious praise team at least. Well, in order for that team to operate in any kind of melodious presentation, they have to have rehearsals. In order to have rehearsals, individuals have to give up their individual purpose for a night and give up what they intended to do in order to come together to have the rehearsal that makes them sing wonderfully. Now, if I insist on doing my thing and you insist on doing your thing, then we'll in order to have a euphonious and melodious presentation. In order for us to come together, you gotta give up something you want. I gotta give up something I could do in order to come together. The problem is that each individual is so concerned about their own individual environment that we no longer have joint participation in the thing that is common. Uh, I wish you'd understand. Whenever I'm using God to make me great, then I won't use God to bring me in unity with my brothers. Because I'm asking God to make me great. Uh, Yo, know, relax. I, I got work to do here. It's a critical piece because uh, many times the question is asked. Uh, let me just put it another way. Uh, you know, many times we do things that uh, now that I'm getting older, I begin to wonder about. And, and one of the things that I wonder about is an invocation when we have an invocation. And of course, we start with prayer because we're inviting God. We're inviting God into the house. Now, I would like to go home uh, and walk up to my house and somebody stands at the door and says to me, Brother Jones, uh, you can come in. I would like you to come in. Uh, just, just come on in. Uh, we're opening the door. I asked them, I said, what, you missed your medicine this morning? Uh, uh, this is my house. You don't invite me into my house. This is my house. Why do we have to invite God into his house? And why do we invite him into his program? Now, I have to invite him into my program, and he may or may not come. But if it's his program, I don't have to invite him into his program. I'm wondering, are we seeking God for our own programs? That's why we can't get along. But if all of us are walking into his program, then he becomes the center and we can have unity among ourselves. Because if there's going to be unity, there's got to be humility. But if there's going to be humility, there's got to be love. I've got to have love to have humility. 
and I've got to have humility to have unity. I feel like shouting. Humility varies then in direct proportion, y'all sit down, to the amount of love that is present. The depth of humility is based on the height of love. Uh, don't fool yourself. I, I think I, I need to maybe switch the word from humility to self-abnegation. Self-abnegation means that I reduce myself out of the security that I have of love. One thing that is important and that is anybody who is insecure does not lean towards humility because insecurity in and of yourself makes you more expressive makes you more ugly because you're not completely satisfied with who you are when you know are. You don't have to get ugly about anything or anybody because you know who you are. And when you know who you are, you're qualified to serve because you're not feeling like you're inferior because you serve. You don't feel like a flunky because you serve because you know who you are. And when you're comfortable with who you are, you can bend down and help somebody else and not feel like you're being used or walked on. Self-abnegation. I have the power to bring myself to the place where I can have unity with my brothers. I don't have to be the biggest mouth in the house. I don't have to be the loudest talker in the house. I can humble myself and be a part of anybody's program, even if I'm not in charge. I feel like preaching. I feel a breakthrough coming. I'm going to have church tonight. I'm going to have it. It's critical now because many times the insecurity makes us ugly. And sometimes we feel as if we're being bombarded or we're being overpowered. There's a difference between being humble and being overpowered. Can, can I preach that for a minute? You see, here you are. You are, let me put it like this, you're married to a man who is 285 pounds, 6 foot 8, 285 pounds of proportion protoplasm. You weigh at best 125 pounds weight and you're having a little argument and he says, shut up. And you say, oh and you go and sit down. Now when you look at that gorilla and you sit down, it's not because you humble yourself. Uh, you just looked at the size of that gorilla and decided that it's best uh, for you to sit down. Now if you look up at that gorilla and you say, hush, and he looks down at you and says, all right, baby, I'm going to shut up. Now it may not be humility, but it looks more like humility because he self-abnegated. Oh, I'm washing your dirty clothes not because you're all that. I'm washing your dirty clothes because I love you and I humble myself to serve you. I cook your dinner out of love and I'm not arguing about going out to eat because I love you. When people love, they humble themselves and they don't argue about things that don't matter because there's humility. Now, what Paul does now is he goes to the perfect example to establish his discussion. And he goes to the great, he doesn't go to Abraham, he doesn't go to David, he doesn't go anywhere to any of the biblical characters. He goes straight to the highest personality of them all. When he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be with God. Now when you look at 
the word form. I think it's critical to understand. The Greek word does not have any idea of shape. It cannot have the idea of shape because if God is not only omniscient, but if he's omnipresent, then the question is what shape does omnipresent have? So form in this context is a philosophical term that has nothing to do with physical shape. What it does now is it's the word used to denote that expression of being which carries in itself the distinctive nature and character of the being to whom it pertains and is thus permanently ideated with the nature and character. Now that sounds a little verbose, so let me go about it another way. The form is an outward expression of an inward essence. Uh -huh. Because now it's applied to God and God is a spirit. So the word is intended to describe the mode in which the essential being God expresses himself. Oh God, let me just tell you the truth here. There is no word which can convey this meaning nor is it possible for us to formulate intellectually the reality of what I just said. Uh, let's take it further. It is conceivable that the essential personality of God may express itself in a mode apprehensible to pure, intelligent, spiritual beings. But to you and I, we can just hint at it a little bit. So just stay with me and we'll work through it. The mode itself is not apprehensible to the conceivable human mind. But the form is magnificent beyond our greatest aspiration or thought. It's magnificent beyond what we can comprehend. But here we can grasp this. The mode of expression, the setting of divine essence, is not identical with the essence itself, but it identifies with it as a natural and appropriate expression, answering to it in every particular. It is the perfect expression of a perfect essence. It is not something that is imposed from without. In other words, Jesus can't go into a closet and put on God. If he is not God, he cannot express God. Well, I won't get there. I'm working with it. Have I told you touch your neighbor yet? It's coming, but not right now. You can't impose it from the outside. It has to come from the inside. Now, you may call me a monkey, but because I act like a monkey, but I can't put on monkey from the outside. I can't be a monkey if I'm not a monkey, because the essence of who I am is going to be expressed on the outside. The form is the outward expression which a person gives from his inmost nature. The expression is not assumed from the outside, but proceeds directly from the inside. Ah, oh, I gotta go about another way. Now you've got fire and you've got heat. The heat is an expression of the fire, but the heat is not the fire. The heat is simply an outward expression of an inward essence. That's why you cannot get heat from ice, because the expression from ice is cold, because the essence of ice is cold. Now the cold is not the ice, the cold 
is simply an expression of the eyes. You see, the Lord's outward expression of his inmost being was to its nature the expression of divine essence. In other words, he couldn't put on God. You can't slip God on if you're not God. Because if you express God, you have to be God in order to express God. Therefore, our Lord then, his nature is the possessor of divine essence or deity. And that follows now then, he is absolute deity himself. So before the man Christ Jesus came, he gave expression to his essential nature of deity, fully and perfectly expressing his godness. Ah, oh, but now he is equal with God because he is God. And he thought it not robbery. Uh, I feel like preaching. Uh, all right, you got me now. Hold it. You see, he expressed deity because he possessed deity. And he thought it not robbery now. Now, the Greeks, there are two meanings for one word. They have one word, robbery, but it has two meanings. The first is, and it cannot apply here, because it's a thing that's unlawfully seized. That's what the Greeks call the robbery. It's unlawfully seized. Well, you can't go into heaven and stick up God and take his godness. So that word is not applicable in this context. The next word is, in the same word, the next meaning is a treasure to be clutched and retained at all hazards. To hold on to something that you need to let go, they call that robbery. Now I'm coming down the street and I'm walking, driving towards the light in my little Kia. I got a little Kia coming and I'm riding down the light and the light is green. That's my right. I look over to my left and I see an 18-wheeler of Kentworth fully loaded coming towards the same light. And I'm saying to myself, he better stop because I have the light. Now I'm insisting on my right because I'm holding on to my right. Uh, no matter what the hazard is, I'm holding on to my right. Now if I don't release my right, I'm going to end up dead right if he comes through that light. So instead of holding on to my right, I'm going to release my right to save my life. Now what God did was, he released his right when he saw me in sin and saw me broken and totally destroyed if he didn't give up his expression. Oh, he couldn't give up his possession, but he gave up his expression in order to bring me out with a mighty hand. He waved his right to express his deity, and he took on the form of a servant. Can I preach like I feel it? Uh, give somebody a high five for the first time and say neighbor he traded one form for another if you understand what I said about form then you understand that he didn't go into the closet and put on the form of a servant he had to have servanthood in him in order to express servanthood that's why he made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself of himself and put on the form of a servant. God is the greatest servant in the world. Who woke you up this morning? Who started each one of us on our way? Who looks out for every one of us on a day-to-day -day basis? Who 
watches for our health, who turns situations, even we're in the Marriott today. It's because God was looking from on high. And God had to fix it so you could get in here. And he shuffled some things around because the greatest servant in the world is God. He keeps everything flowing. He keeps everything up and up. He's there when you're discouraged. He's there when your heart is broken. He serves you when you won't serve yourself. He looks out for you when you won't look out for yourself. Some of you even said he's better to me than I have been to myself. He's the greatest servant and the expression then of his inward nature and character is still deity. He released to express another inward nature of his being that servanthood exchanging one form for the other. The problem here now is what did he give up? He gave up the expression, but never the possession. And he gave up the expression so much until they couldn't identify that he was God. Because God is never identified. He's never recognized. He's all always revealed because he'll come in here so humble I feel like preaching he'll come in here so humble that you didn't even know it was God the foxes have holes the birds of the air have nests but I the son of man have nowhere to lay his head and yet still we who are supposed to be his servants are so stuck upon who we are that we can't humble ourselves even to get along with each other. I feel like having just a little church. Are you there? I feel like lifting him up. He was so humble that for nine months he subjected himself to a woman's womb. He was so humble that he was born in a manger, subjected to parental guidance. Let this mind be in you. He was hungry, he was tired. He was questioned, he was ignored. He was ridiculed. The Bible said he came to his own and his own knew him not. Isaiah said he had no form nor comeliness. There was no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. He was despised and we who he came to save esteemed him not. His disciples frustrated him. Men cried and said, send for angels. But he declared, my kingdom is not of this world. I feel like preaching. They spat on him. They cursed him. They mocked him. They dragged him to three courts. They crowned him with thorns. They flogged him. Then they crucified him. They nailed him between the intermittent partial space of his foot and cut the paranormal nerve and sent fire this way. They nailed him between the radius and the compass bone and cut the median nerve and his hand closed like a claw. And when it closed like a claw, he said, and no man shall pluck them out of my hand because he died with a death grip on me. A death grip that you can't pull me out of his hand. They nailed him when he moved, when he breathed the fire, would run through his body. I feel like preaching. And the fire would run through his body. And the reason I'm not going to hell is because he had hell in his body to deliver me. And he died the death of a servant. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Can I preach like a feel it? He made him sin who knew no sin. He made him homosexuality, but he wasn't a homosexual. He 
made him fornication, but he wasn't a fornicator. He made him lying, but he was not a liar. He made him lesbianism, but he wasn't a lesbian. He made him witchcraft, but he wasn't a witch. He made him sorcery, but he wasn't a sorcerer. He made him adultery, but he wasn't a you somewhere in there. Therefore, because he went so low, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. I feel like preaching. Give somebody a high five and say, neighbor, that's my God. What a name. There is no name like the name of Jesus. There is no name like the name of Jesus. I want to borrow from S.N. Lockridge tonight. Give somebody a high five and say he's the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of the heavens. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Give somebody a high five and ask them, do you know that name? The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. There is no means of measure that can define his limitless love. There is no far-seeing telescope that can bring into visibility the coat mine of his shoreless supplies. There is no barrier that can hinder him from pouring out a blessing. Give somebody a high five and say what a name. He's adoringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally grateful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Pull on your neighbor and say what a name. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's a constant piece of civilization. He stands in solitude of himself. He is august. He is unique. He is unparalleled. He is unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. Give somebody a high five and say, what a name. What a name. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the highest personality in higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine in true theology. He's the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion. What a name. Give somebody a high five. Say, I know the name. That name is Jesus. He's a miracle of the age. He's superlative of everything good you choose to call him. He's the only one able to supply all of our needs. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted. He sympathizes and saves. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick, cleanses the leper, discharges better, forgives the sinner, delivers the captain, defends the feeble, blesses the young, serves the unfortunate, regards the aged, rewards the diligent, beautifies the meek. Do you know what his name is? Jesus. What a name. What a name. He is the key of knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the gateway of glory. He's the highway of holiness. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. Do you know God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name? His office is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His 
mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy. And his burdens are light. I wonder, do you know what his name is? God has highly exalted him and given him a name. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. I don't want to tell you. You can't get him off your mind. You can't wash him off your hands. You can't outlive him. And you sure can't live without him. That's why he's my God. I feel like giving him some praise. Give somebody high five. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Yes. Yes. I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the breakthrough the Pharisees couldn't stand him. They couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimony to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Because he's got a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee, give somebody high five. Say, bye.
Yes. We're so caught up in our identity, yeah, yeah. we have lost our relevance. Yeah. Because we're stuck in identity. So we're no longer relevant. Because we're too proud to reach for the lowly. Yeah, 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 yes. And so we're limited in the name we can have. But when you reach down into the depth of the muck and the mire that yes, you pull people out, yes, God takes you to the other height. I'm closing. But the thing that has slipped up on us so dreadfully, and I'm not talking from the position of a hater. Because anything I don't have, I didn't want. I'm not talking from a position of a hater. But the meanest animal in the zoo is not the devil. The meanest animal in the zoo is not the devil. And when I'm teaching young preachers, this is what we call upsetting the equilibrium. That is, you're not going to leave here until you hear the explanation of this. We have made the meanest animal in the devil, in the zoo, the devil. He's not the meanest animal in the zoo. Jesus did not put God on one side and the devil on the other side no. as to who to serve. No. Right. Bring it down. Bring it. The contradistinctive alternative was not God versus devil. It was you can't serve God and man. Yeah. Right. Wow. Didn't bring the devil up. Right. The devil has not been regarded as the root of all evil. Not the devil. It's the love of money. serving God or money. Because you can't serve two masters. What we have done is let a few dollars make us feel superior to everybody else. Loving money. And it's so natural because all that is in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. Now notice he didn't say all that's in the world, yachts and private jets and Mercedes Benzes and Rolls Royces and big houses. He didn't list it like that. He said all that's in the world is how you look at it. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh and pride of life and money takes care of all that. Can't serve God yeah. and money. Because you're going to end up with the deceitfulness of riches. And if you think your money makes you better than the next person, you have missed the point. Let this mind be in you. Foxes at home. The birds of the air have nests, but I, the Son of Man, have nowhere to lay his head. If you don't have any way to lay your head, you're homeless. But the homeless Jesus walked on water. The homeless Jesus raised the dead. The homeless Jesus fed 5,000. Saints of the Most High God. In order for us to move to the next level, from this pulpit to the back, we have to humble ourselves. And we have to focus not on who we are or what we will become, but that joint participation.
participation in things common to all of us. And if there's one thing that should be common to us, one being, that is our Lord and Savior, hey. Jesus hey. Christ. And when he is the center, yes, sir. then we will take care of the homeless. Yes. We will see about our boys who are coming one out of three. Yeah. Is in the system. Yep. We will orchestrate re-entry programs. Yep. Wow. We will work on preventing our young people yeah. from being fed to this prison system. Yeah. They don't mind talking about prevention. No. They, they hate prevention. They don't mind talking about intervention. Right. In California alone, wow. there are 400 prisons. Average inmates, 4,000 per prison, at 85,000 a year for each one. Look at that. It's a $1.2 billion business, and it's being fed by blacks and browns. And you can't have church. No, sir. You can't have church if that is not one of your concerns. You can't have church if the kids who are going hungry during summer, hungry during school time. Each church ought to adopt a school. We ought to adopt a school in our neighborhoods and go see and make sure that our kids get what they need. But in order to do that, we got to get out of our sealed buildings, out of our sanctuary. Humble ourselves. I want you to take one person by both hands. Get a prayer partner. If you have to stand, stand. If you can do it sitting, that's fine. The respect that God has for us is enormous. He respects us more than we respect ourselves. Because he says, whatever you bind on earth, I will bind in heaven. On earth. I will lose. You're holding a binding hand. You're holding a losing hand. Father, I come in the name of Jesus. And I bind depression. I bind low self-esteem. I bind insecurity. I bind self-doubt. I bind every spirit of procrastination. I bind laziness. Oh yes, I bind every proud, full spirit. I come against pride right now. Every pride that would show its head in the midst of this congregation, I bind it right now. Every narcissistic, egomaniacal spirit, every selfish spirit, I bind it right now. I bind whispering and slandering. I bind negative thinking. I bind suicidal thoughts. I bind every negative thing. I come against it right now in the name of Jesus. I bind satanic oppression. I bind it right now. Satan will not run anything in here. I bind every love of money that will cause us to distort the gospel and hurt other people over money. I bind every spirit like that right now. I bind the con game. I bind the con man. I bind it right now. I bind the user and the taker. I bind the exporter and the manipulator. I bind that right now. Now squeeze the other hand. I lose power. I lose anointing. I lose humility. I lose your grace. I lose your gifts. I lose you. I lose you. I lose you. Right now, everything about you that God raised you up to be, I lose you right now to perform, to operate, to walk in your anointing, to live in your purpose, to build your ministry. I lose you right now for greater things. And if you believe God, lose those hands and give him the glory. Give him the glory. Give him the glory.
absolutely no way to sit down. And I want you to hold your seats unless there's an emergency. They are still young. If you're in this house at all and you're not saved, you haven't experienced the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't do it without me. Lift your voice and say, Lord. 